Tonight's topic is uh, talking about Israel's biblical report card, Pass or Fail, which reminds me of a story about uh, a teacher who had a group of young teenagers and uh, she wanted to give them a test, but she saw that she wasn't going to be able to have them complete the test at school. And so she asked, would you please all take the test home and fill it in at home, but remember, there's no cheating. Remember that a person cannot cheat and live with themselves. Well, all the students take their tests home, and the next morning they bring them back. Well, the teacher's sitting there marking the tests, and she finds that one of the tests is perfect every answer. But at the bottom there's an explanation. The note says, I find that I can cheat and live with myself better than I can flunk and live with my father. And so when it comes to passing and failing, everybody has a sense of being hard on themselves, not being able to deal with this sense that perhaps I wasn't perfect. When we look at things that we've done, we tend to feel, I could have done that better. Oh, now I just remembered something that I wanted to say then. It's such a shame. And we give ourselves a really hard, um, hard time. We set standards very high for ourselves. But what's the truth is the same for the way God seems to place his expectations with us. God also, throughout the scripture, seems to set a very high standard. And so when we examine some of the passages in the Bible, in the Jewish scriptures, which speak about God's, so to speak, evaluation of our performance, we find ourselves um, exposed to harsh criticism, which is often um, connected with um, divine retribution, where we are punished for our sins. And when we walk away reading these texts, especially if we read them in isolation, we tend to walk away feeling that perhaps we failed. Perhaps we failed. Perhaps we haven't done as we should have done. And so what do we do? What do we do about it? And so what I want to do today is I want to look a little bit closer at some of the criticisms that we find within the scriptures and hopefully give a fuller picture of what's going on. One example in particular that I found very um, enlightening, it really helped me understand how God often deals with the Jewish people, is a story that we find in the book of Joshua. So we know that Joshua led the Jewish people into the land of Israel and he led them in battle and was able to conquer cities in miraculous ways. One of the famous, most famous stories probably, is a story in Jericho, where they surrounded the walls and they blew trumpets and the walls came crumbling down and they defeated the, the city of Jericho with no resistance at all. And what we find is, in chapter 7 of the book of Joshua, Joshua sends some spies to go to a place called Ai. And he wants them to see whether it's fortified, how many troops need to go up, and the spies come back and give a report that really, we don't need to send a large army up there. There are not that many people up there. Two to 3,000 is more than plenty. And what happens is they send up um, around 3,000 men, and to everybody's shock, the resistance was incredible. The Jewish people um, sustained a loss of 36 men, and Joshua is distraught. He, what's happened? What, why has all of a sudden God's favor turned from us? And in Joshua chapter 7, verse 11, God responds to Joshua, and he tells him, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant. Now, when you hear those words, that's heavy. The nation of Israel? Well, what did they do? And how come Joshua doesn't know about it? I mean, you'd think the leader of the nation, somebody who's so close, someone who's taken over from Moses, 
would really know that Israel had sinned and violated the covenant. And yet here he is, doesn't understand why God has removed his favor from the Jewish people. He continues and he says, this is a, they violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. What did they do? They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen, they have lied, they have put them in their own possessions. So we know from the previous chapter, chapter 6, Joshua had commanded the Jewish people that they were not to touch any of the booty that had been, uh, that had been taken from Jericho. And we read at the beginning of chapter 7, verse 1, about a particular individual. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1 says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So here what we see is a typical example of where one person from the Jewish people's sins but God does not only look at that person as an individual. God sees them as part of a, a, co a corporate entity. And so therefore there's the collective guilt of the nation, which God um, demands from the Jewish people. And we see this uh, with quite devastating um, results and consequences for the Jewish people. So here you have one man sin sinning, and yet in the eyes of God, it's as if all Israel had sinned. Another example in the Jewish scriptures where you have this idea of collective guilt is when some of the Israelites um, went out not only during the weekdays to collect the manna, they went out on the Sabbath. When God had told them there'll be no manna on Sabbath, but they go out to collect the manna. And in Exodus chapter 16, verse 28, God turns to Moses and he says, How long will you refuse to observe my commandments and my teachings? Who's you? And here, you in the, in the passage is in the plural. And it refers to all of Israel, including Moses. And we find throughout the scriptures that any time there's any kind of rebuke to the Jewish people, most often the prophets include themselves in that rebuke as if they are part of the people who are being rebuked. But the fact that the nation is declared guilty doesn't preclude that there are some in the nation that are righteous. In fact, we read in, in, in the prophets where Elijah says that God had preserved 7,000 prophets, even though the rest of the nation had gone off and worshipped idols. Another important point to consider when we start looking at whether we've passed or failed and how to evaluate is that God sees the same people from different angles. Let us take the nation of Israel, for example. At times, God describes us as a stiff-necked people, people who have turned their backs against him. And yet there are other times, such as in Numbers chapter 23, when Bilam is speaking on behalf of God, where they're described as the people that God sees no iniquity or perversiveness. And which one is it? Have they been stiff-necked? Or does God not see any iniquity in them? A similar contradiction is actually found with the life of David. David sometimes describes his sin, and sometimes in great detail. And yet there are other places where David describes himself as righteous. So for example, in Psalms chapter 7 or Psalms chapter 18 verse 25, David refers to himself as being righteous. And so which one is it? Was he a sinner or was he righteous? When we understand that God judges people on different levels, we'll begin to understand that it's not so simple. We'll begin to understand that there are allowances that God makes because God reckons that we are frail people, we're just human beings. As it says in Psalm 103, that God forgives us often because he recognizes our frailties, because he, fra he recognizes our humanity. The fact that Jewish people often suffer for their sins, or as somebody once said, we're not punished for our sins, but we're punished by our sins. But the fact that we often 
are met with consequences because of our sin is something that is plainly clear in scripture many times where God tells us that as a result of our sins we, 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 we will suffer but at the same time the same Bible describes us as those who have not violated God's covenant such as in Psalms 44 verse 18 where the Jewish people are praised for their commitment and for their devotion to God the prophet tells us that in the messianic era Israel will ultimately be vindicated and their righteousness will be obvious to all this can be found in Isaiah 62 verse 2 and the prophet Isaiah also tells us that Israel will be rewarded for having hoped to God throughout their long exile. You can find this in Isaiah chapter 25 verse 9, 26 verse 2, and Isaiah 49 verse 23. And so, to summarize, it's very nuanced when it comes to the record of the Jewish people. There's no question that we demand more from ourselves and God demands more from ourselves. But at the same time, God recognizes all the virtues all the virtues and all the devotion and the commitment that we've had to God throughout the ages despite all the trials and tribulations.